Settlers, Chapter 12, Section 3, The Export of Production. The unoccupied zone of Mexico, just south of the artificial border, provides a clear example. There, in 1982, some 128,000 Mexicano women labored in the maquilas, the factories set up by U.S. corporations to assemble parts from the U.S. into finished products, which are then shipped back north across the artificial border. The average wage is less than a dollar an hour, with a 48-hour work week. RCA, Caterpillar Tractor, Ford, Chrysler, American Motors, and many other major corporations have maquilas. GM has 10 such plants in the unoccupied zone. Foster Grant sunglasses, Samsonite luggage, Mattel toys, and many other familiar products come in part out of the maquilas. The rate of profit is enormous. In 1978, the Mexicano women assemblers and machine operators in the maquilas added a total of $12.7 billion in value to the products they made for U.S. corporations. At the same time, total wages paid to the then 90,000 workers were less than $336 million, roughly one-thirty-sixth of the value they created. These profits of billions of dollars each year never even pass through neocolonial Mexico, of course. The U.S. oppressor nation receives a flow of inexpensively produced consumer and industrial goods. U.S. finance capital and the multinationals are aided in shoring up their rate of profits, while a shrinking number of Euro-American workers are still enabled to receive their necessary high wages. While everyone understands instantly the unemployment problem caused by corporations moving their factories abroad, there is much less light shed on how some Euro-American workers benefit from it. To be sure, every trade union favors full factory employment with $20,000 per year wages. Average U.S. wages for manufacturing production workers are slightly above $16,000 per year. Those days are gone forever, the monetary fruits of, quote, boom, economy, and monopoly markets. Now, for at least some Euro-American workers to retain those high-wage jobs, and the bosses to still profitably use U.S. factories with considerable capital invested in them, labor costs have to be averaged down by blending in super-exploited colonial labor. American Motors, for example, says this explicitly. An AMC spokesman said, quote, We established a strategy to continue to operate U.S. plants, but to expand in Mexico to average our costs downward. End quote. Fisher Price has five toy factories in the U.S., but its Mexican plant, the smallest, produced the toy tape recorder that was their number one profit maker in 1982. Reason? Dollar an hour wages. Or take GM's modernization to compete with imports. Recently, General Motors announced a $200 million plan to frankly imitate, quote, Toyota City. Toyota's primary, highly integrated complex in Japan. GM hopes that reorganization and robotizing its main Buick plants into a Buick City in Flint, Michigan, will let it reduce costs by $1,500 per car. Of course, today's 8,600 Buick workers in Flint will be slashed by 3,600, 40% by 1986.
GM, which even now employs one skilled technician for every 5.6 production workers. Hopes for the ratio to be one-to-one -one by the robotized future of the year 2000. Many auto workers will lose their jobs, but a large minority will still have their high-wage positions. Where does GM get the $200 million to modernize Buick production, to stay competitive, and, incidental to that, still employ high-wage Euro-American workers? While GM might say, quote, retained earnings, or, quote, raising capital on the bond market, we note that the labor costs saved by GM in producing some auto parts for the U.S., in its 10 Mexican plants, instead of Detroit, is over $200 million per year. That is not their profits, but their super profits, above and beyond normal profits, gotten from a dollar an hour labor. GM can have renewed factories, and a number of Euro-American auto workers can still keep their high-wage jobs. So, while the liberals and radicals see high-wage U.S. production and low-wage colonial production as opposed to each other, it is truer that there is an interrelationship and even a dependency. The flashy production of robots and automation, of oppressor nation technicians and workers drawing advanced wages, draws sustenance from the ordinary physical labor and skills of the Mexican proletariat. Quote, nations become almost as classes, end quote. The maquilas do not constitute any economic development for Mexico. They are just labor-intensive intrusions of U.S. manufacturing. It isn't just the profits that go to the U.S. oppressor nation. The U.S. receives both the super profits and the consumer products themselves, while retaining all the white-collar, managerial, professional, clerical, technical, and distributive jobs made possible by the production. Even in this form of giving Mexican women employment at wages five times the usual rate in the rural areas, the imperialist looting has a destructive effect on the social fabric. The border maquilas gather women from all over the unoccupied zone, while helping to force jobless men north across the artificial border. So this export of production is often a Trojan horse to the third world. Even worse is the parasitic trend of looting the third world for foodstuffs, shifting agricultural production for U.S. consumption in part to the oppressed nations. The entire imperialist bloc is joining in on this. In 1980, the Far East Economic Review noted that in poor Asian nations, quote, the new export-oriented luxury food agribusiness is undoubtedly the fastest growing agriculture sector. Fruit, vegetables, seafood, and poultry are filling European, American, and above all, Japanese supermarket shelves. End quote. In Mexico, this has reached grotesque proportions. Within the unoccupied zone, the area of western Sinaloa alone supplies some 50% of all winter vegetables consumed in the U.S. Thousands of peasants have been displaced, driven off traditional lands to make way for the large plantations and their gunmen that are neocolonial agents for the U.S. supermarket chains. The land is Mexican, the labor is Mexicano, only the profits and consumption are Euro-American. There is nothing too subtle about this. 
white America is parasitic on the Mexicano nation, taking food from the starving to help fill up the fabled American supermarket. A report from Mexico in the New York Times tells the price paid by that oppressed nation for involuntarily maintaining the, quote, American way of life. Beginning of long quote. Reliable statistics on nutrition levels do not exist, although the 1970 census concluded that 30% of the population, then over 60 million, were undernourished. Another 30% suffered malnutrition, and at least 20% were obese because of poorly balanced diets. Quote, the first indicator is when we see infant mortality rising again said Dr. Adolfo Chavez, head of nutrition in the National Nutrition Institute. Quote, in some really depressed rural communities, few children born since 1974 have survived. We have what we call generational holes. But infant mortality is also growing in slum areas of the cities. More than 100,000 children die here each year because of the relationship between malnutrition and transmittable diseases, he said. Quote, continued, And of the 2 million or so born each year, at least 1.5 million will not adequately develop their mental, physical, and social functions. End of quote. Longer quote continued. As in many developing countries, agricultural priorities are, first, food for export, second, food for industrial processing, and only third, food for the population at large. While winter vegetables, strawberries, tomatoes, and coffee are being produced for export, for example, the government must import corn and beans. Similarly, according to official figures, more basic grains are consumed for animal forage than by 20 million peasants. End quote. We should note here that the peculiar chemical mechanized U.S. agriculture is itself highly specialized primarily oriented around the subsidized mass productions of feed grains. Two-thirds of all U.S. agricultural exports are feed grains used in raising livestock. Most of these exports are to the industrial powers, Europe, Japan, and the USSR. While much of the $16 billion in foodstuffs the U.S. imports each year is from the Third World, in Mexico, the neo-colonial economy imports grain from the U.S. to raise meat for the upper and middle classes, while exporting significant amounts of its own food productivity. So all over the Third World, the oppressed not only supply U.S. imperialism with raw materials, but increasingly labor in both the factories and, quote, the factories in the fields to send the U.S. a growing stream of consumer and industrial products, and even foodstuffs. The world plantation is still very real in the age of the computer. We say that the first makes the second possible. End of section three.